Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, BYU President Kevin J. Worthen and Sister Peggy Worthen will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our first devotional of this new school year. My name is Keith Vorkink, and I am the Advancement Vice President and will conduct today's devotional. We are pleased to have President Kevin J. Worthen and Sister Peg Peggy Worthen here to speak to us. We also express appreciation to Neil Harmon, adjunct professor in the School of Music, for providing the prelude music and for accompanying us on the opening hymn. We thank Mia Reynolds, a senior choral music education major from Ellensburg, Washington, for leading us in the opening hymn. We invite you to join us here in the Marriott Center next week for our campus devotional when we will have the opportunity and blessing to hear from President Dallin H. Oaks First Counselor in the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Today's invocation will be given by Liv Griffin, a freshman majoring in political science from Harrisburg, North Carolina. Immediately following the prayer, Ethan Simpson, a junior majoring in vocal performance from Eagle, Idaho, will sing Consider the Lilies. He will be accompanied by Madison Wilde Thunhorst, a graduate student in violin performance from Portland, Oregon, on the violin, and Kylie Linton, a junior studying piano performance from Eagle, Idaho, on the piano. And now the invocation by Sister Griffin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee so much for the chance that we have to be here today to hear from leaders in our lives, and we ask that thou would please bless the Spirit to be with us, to guide us throughout this day and throughout our time here at BYU. Please help us to go forth and serve with all that we learn here, and we thank thee for modern-day prophets and the gift of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Please help us to use his atonement more fully in our lives. We say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Thank you, Brother Simpson and Sisters Thunhorst and Linton for sharing your musical talents with us today and inviting the Spirit into our devotional. Today we are so blessed to hear from President and Sister Worthen. The Worthens were raised in Price, Utah and began dating after President Worthen returned from serving a mission to Monterey, Mexico, and while both were attending the College of Eastern Utah. The Worthens were married in the Provo, Utah LDS Temple. Early on in their marriage, Sister Worthen worked to support their family as President Worthen finished his education and began his career. She then resumed her education after their youngest child started school and subsequently earned her degree in English from BYU in 2003. Sister Worthen has a variety of interests from cougar sports to reading and spending time with their grandchildren. She also is a lifelong learner and continues to take classes on campus. Brigham Young University has shaped much of President Worthen's life. He also grew up an avid uh, Cougar sports fan and, and still is today, and earned both his bachelor's degree and political science degree in political science and his Juris Doctorate degree from BYU. After practicing law in Arizona, he began teaching in the J. Reuben Clark Law School in 1987 and served as dean of the law school from 2004 to 2008. President Worthen then served as the advancement vice president bef before becoming the 13th president of Brigham Young University on May 1, 2014. Hopefully you can begin to see why he describes himself as a BYU guy through and through. President and Sister Worthen are the parents of two sons and a daughter, and they have seven grandchildren. And they currently teach the 16, 17-year-old Sunday school class in their home ward. At the close of their remarks, the benediction will be offered by Michael Andrew, a junior accounting major from Graham, Washington. Sister Worthen. Welcome to fall semester 2022. I hope that the first week of the semester has gone well for you. Sometimes you may find your coursework a bit challenging, but you have wisely chosen to further your education to acquire more knowledge and hopefully gain more understanding. And I can assure you that that is a very good thing. The story is told of a certain rabbi who went on a journey with the prophet Elijah. They walked all day, and at nightfall, they came to the humble cottage of a poor man whose only treasure was a cow. The poor man ran out of his cottage, and his wife ran too, to welcome the strangers for the night and to offer them all the simple hospitality which they were able to give in straitened circumstances. Elijah and the rabbi were entertained with plenty of the cow's milk, sustained by homemade bread and butter, and they were put to sleep in the best bed while their kindly hosts lay down before the kitchen fire. But in the morning, the poor man's cow was dead. They walked all the next day and came that evening to the house of a very, very wealthy merchant whose hospitality they craved. The merchant was cold and proud and rich and all that he would do for the prophet and his companion was to lodge them in a cow shed and feed them on bread and water. In the morning, however, Elijah thanked him very much for what he had done and sent a mason to repair one of his walls, which happened to be falling down as a return for his kindness. The rabbi, unable to keep silence any longer, begged the holy man to explain the meaning of his dealings with human beings. In regard to the poor man who received us so hospitably, replied the prophet, it was decreed that his wife was to die that night, but in reward for his goodness, God took the cow instead of his wife. I repaired the wall of the rich miser because a chest of gold was concealed near the place and if the miser had repaired the wall himself, he would have discovered the treasure. Say not therefore to the Lord, What doest thou? But say in thy heart, Must not the Lord of all the earth do right? 
The rabbi found it difficult to understand the injustice of what he had witnessed and desperately wanted an explanation from Elijah. It is a natural tendency to question, as the rabbi did, the unfairness of the difficulties and opposition we see in our lives and in the lives of others who are doing everything they can to follow and serve the Lord. We may find ourselves trying to understand why some things seem to come so easily for others, like good grades or better job offers, but leave us feeling uncertain and full of doubt. What Elijah offered the rabbi in response to ra the rabbi's desperate desire to grasp the situation was a valuable lesson in understanding that our ways are not the Lord's way. And without gaining an eternal perspective, we, like the rabbi, may assume that in some situations the Lord acts unjustly. All of us are bound to experience what could be viewed as unjust results or undeserved, undeserved maladies. As President Oaks has explained, all of us experience various kinds of oppositions that test us. Some of these tests are temptations to sin. Some are mortal challenges apart from personal sin. Some are very great, some are minor. Some are continuous, and some are mere episodes. None of us is exempt. Yet, from an eternal perspective, these experiences are not without purpose. Instead, as President Oaks notes, opposition permits us to grow toward what our Heavenly Father would have us become. In other words, viewed from an eternal perspective, opposition, challenge, and trials are essential and inevitable elements of this life. Knowing this, the question becomes, how should we respond when we are faced with these inevitabilities? To me, it's comforting to know that we have a choice. We can choose to be agents unto ourselves, or we can, be cho or we can choose to be acted upon. And as comforting as it is to know we can choose how to respond, it is even more comforting to know that we need not face the opposition and challenges alone. Our loving Father in Heaven has provided us with a Savior to help us if we choose to let Him into our lives. Choosing to act and to let the Savior into our lives is not easy, but it makes all the difference. President Nelson recently asked young adults, though this applies to all of us, to consider the following questions. What do you, do you want to feel peace about concerns that presently plague you? Do you want to know Jesus Christ better? Do you want to learn how His divine power can heal your wounds and weaknesses? Do you want to experience the sweet, soothing power of the Atonement of Jesus Christ working in your life? President Nelson emphasized that each of us can obtain these desired results, but seeking to answer these questions will require effort, much effort. And he pleaded, not merely suggested, that we take charge of our testimony, work for it, own it, care for it, nurture it so that it will grow, feed it the truth. Although President Nelson's plea to take charge of our testimonies was directed to a worldwide audience, taking charge of our own testimony of Jesus Christ is a very personal endeavor. We can't rely on other people's testimonies, nor can we replace nor can we place the responsibility of our choices on others. President Nelson has entreated us to assume control and become responsible for our own testimony. This requires us to work in a sustained effort. If you currently lack or are struggling with your testimony, keep pressing on. As you search for Heavenly Father's hand in overcoming your daily struggles, your testimony will grow and become your own. But it doesn't stop there. Our testimony of Jesus Christ must be nurtured and maintained through all that our Heavenly Father has provided us. The process of taking charge of our own testimonies can be demanding and exacting, but 
Through the process, we become more refined. Through the process, we learn how deeply our Heavenly Father and our Savior loves us. Through the process, our testimony of Jesus Christ gives us divine perspective. And as President Nelson has assured, as we make our testimony our highest priori priority, we can watch for miracles to happen in our lives. One of the miracles that will occur is that you will gain an eternal perspective, which will lead to greater understanding of and appreciation for the opposition and challenges you will face in this life. This eternal perspective can be transforming as we gain greater understanding of God's purposes. C.S. Lewis beautifully illustrated this point. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he is doing. He is getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You, need, you knew those jobs needed doing, so you are not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abom abominably and does not seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. At times it may seem like the poor man whose cow died, we are not just we are not receiving a just reward. Perhaps despite all your efforts to strengthen your testimony of the Savior, and despite your diligent studying, you will not obtain the grade you desire. But in those instances, if you understand God's purposes, you will know the greatness of God. You can rest assured that He shall consecrate thine afflictions for thy gain. Although you may feel devastated in the moment, your faith in our Savior can and will carry you through until the day when you realize how that seemingly merciless outcome helped you transform into the best, divinely appointed version of yourself. It is my prayer that as we strengthen and nourish our own personal testimony of Jesus Christ, we will be blessed with a greater understanding and knowledge of what our Heavenly Father would have us become. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As we begin the new academic year, let me join Peggy in welcoming you back to BYU. It's so good to see you here and to feel your excitement and energy. Fall is a rejuvenating time of year at universities. It's also a time of choices and decisions. Your array of education-related choices has expanded over the years. In elementary school, the school determined when your first class began, what subjects you would study and who would teach the subject. The school also decided when you ate lunch, what you had for lunch, and even what you did with your recreation time during the day. <clears throat> Over the years, as you gained more experience, your involvement in the choices expanded. In high school, you had choices concerning some of the subjects and some of the teachers, but your choices were still quite limited. Suddenly, as a college student, you now have almost unlimited choices. You can determine when your first class begins and what courses and which professors to take. If you want a break from classes in the afternoon, you can arrange that. If you want a long, longer lunch hour, you can schedule accordingly. You even get to decide whether to show up for classes. Thank goodness compulsory education laws don't apply to colleges. <laughs> Your educational choices also include more basic things like which university to attend and what major to pursue. In addition to expanded educational options, you also face decisions that can affect your eternal trajectory, like whether to serve a mission or whom to marry. 
Just as you gained more educational choices as you matured since first grade, the scope of your general choices will broaden as you make wise choices. This pattern will continue into eternity as your wise choices in mortality can ultimately lead to exaltation and its endless opportunities for joy. As I contemplated what to say to you that would help you at this key decision-making point in your lives, my mind kept returning to last May when we witnessed an extraordinary event. President Russell M. Nelson, the prophet of the Lord, invited all young adults throughout the world to attend a special meeting to receive a message directly from him. He encouraged those within driving distance to attend in person at the conference center in Salt Lake City. It was a remarkable evening. Young adults from the Wasatch Front responded in large numbers. Not only did they fill all 20,000 seats in the conference center, thousands of others congregated in overflow areas on Temple Square, and hundreds of thousands watched online throughout the world. President Nelson's message was powerful and profound. It touched on key issues, such as the difference between secular education and spiritual education. It clarified important fundamental truths, such as the truth of who we are, the truth about what Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have offered us, and the truth about our own conversion. Each of these topics by itself was compelling. Each by itself could be the focus of a devotional address, or two, or three. Every time I reread President Nelson's talk, I received new insights on each individual topic. But that only made my task more complicated. The quandary I faced was how to choose which topic to emphasize. Each was so powerful. Each was so important. At one point, I thought, maybe I should just show you a video of President Nelson's talk. <laughs> After all, President Mary G. Romney, on one occasion, emphasized the importance of President J. Ruben Clark's seminal discourse on the chartered course of higher education by reading to his audience almost verbatim President Clark's entire talk. <laughs> but I had a feeling that my stewardship for this devotion required that I do more than press the play button on a video. So I continued to pray and ponder. The answer came when, after having read the talk several times, I noticed for the first time the title of President Nelson's talk, Choices for Eternity. As I read those three words, the thought forcefully hit me that President Nelson had not only provided prophetic counsel on fundamental truths and inspired direction on individual topics of immediate relevance to young adults, he had also given an overarching sermon, some would call it a meta-narrative, on choices and decisions. Viewed in that light, the talk and several of the individual topics President Nelson addressed took on deeper meaning for me. For example, in discussing the difference between secular and spiritual education, President Nelson emphasized the three absolute truths that should form the foundation of our spiritual education. Number one, that each of us is going to die. Number two, that because of Jesus Christ, each of us is going to be resurrected and become immortal. And number three, that judgment day is ahead for each of us. That insight by itself is invaluable to BYU students who are engaged in an educational process that seeks to bring secular and spiritual education into one great whole. However, President Nelson went on to expressly state that he had an even larger goal in mind when he presented those truths. My purpose tonight, he said, is to make sure that your eyes are wide open to the truth that this life really is the time when you get to decide what kind of life you want to live forever. There it is in plain terms. President Nelson's purpose was to make sure we clearly understand that we get to decide our ultimate destiny. In a similar vein, and in that same section of the talk, President Nelson asserted, during this life, we get to choose which laws we are willing to obey and therefore in which kingdom of glory we will live forever. Pause for a moment to ponder the significance of those observations and their insight into the impact of our choices. We get to decide. We get to choose the most important thing in our existence, our eternal destiny. God will live, leave that up to us. Now, that doesn't mean that we can simply check a box on an eternal menu and say, I choose this kingdom. Our eternal destiny is not determined solely by a single act but through a lifetime of actions and decisions. 
Those actions and decisions prepare us to live in accordance with eternal laws. Which laws we are prepared to live in turn determine our ultimate destiny. As the scriptures put it, for he who is not able to abide the law of a celestial kingdom cannot abide a celestial glory. And he who cannot abide the law of a terrestrial kingdom cannot abide a terrestrial glory. And he who cannot abide the law of a telestial kingdom cannot abide a telestial glory. To repeat President Nelson, during this life, we get to choose which laws we are willing to obey and therefore in which kingdom of glory we will live forever. Our destiny is ultimately determined by our deepest desires. As Alma stated, God granted unto men, granteth unto men according to their desire. But that true desire, that will, which ultimately governs our decisions, is both manifested and shaped by our actions. Likewise, our actions are manifested and shaped by our desires. Through an iterative process, desire and action can ultimately merge into one harmonious whole where there is no gap between our desire to do something and its actual accomplishment. Thus, it is said of God, who is the perfect example of one willing to abide by the law of a celestial kingdom, quote, there is nothing that the Lord thy God shall take in his heart to do, but he will do it, close quote. There is no gap between desire and action in a celestial being. This wholeness or integrity changes our very nature. Those abiding by a celestial law abide that law not because it is a requirement, but because that is what they desire to do. That is who they have become. That truth should impact the way we approach and think about the choices we make. When faced with a decision, we might profitably ask ourselves, is my choice consistent with celestial laws, or am I settling for a telestial level of glory? The answer to that question will be manifested and shaped not only by our actions, but also by our motivation, by our desire. Let me provide a simple example. Let's imagine that we're in a combined Fifth Sunday meeting and the bishop announces that there is a service opportunity to help a widow in the area. There's no conflict, direct conflict with any mandatory event on your calendar, but finals are only a week away and you think it might be a good time to finally start studying. Now, you could make it to the project, service project, but it would be inconvenient and it might cost you a little. If you decide not to take the assignment, you might be living a celestial law. You're not a bad person. The widow's needs will be met and you will better, be better prepared for finals, assuming you actually study during that time that you would be doing this. Alternatively, you might guilt yourself into accepting the assignment, maybe even hoping that God would help you with your finals if you make the sacrifice. Acting out, of this, acting out of this sense of duty or hope of a reward might be living a terrestrial law. It's better than not helping, but still short of what it might be. Finally, you could gratefully accept the assignment, welcoming the opportunity to do something that brings you true joy. That would be living a celestial law. And acting in that way with that motivation would change both your attitude about serving and your very nature you would begin to understand the profound truth described by President Marion G. Romney and emphasized by Elder Christofferson just a couple of weeks ago here. Service, said President Romney, is not something we endure on this earth so we can earn the right to live in the celestial kingdom. Service is the very fiber of which an exalted life in the celestial kingdom is made. Knowing that service is what gives our Father in heaven fulfillment and knowing that we want to be where he is and as he is, why must we be commanded to serve one another? Oh, for the glorious day when these things all come naturally because of the purity of our hearts. In that day, there will be no need for a commandment because we will have experienced for ourselves that we are truly happy only when we are engaged in unselfish service. People abiding by a celestial law serve not because they are commanded to do so. They do it because of who they have become. They want to serve. Their deepest desire is to serve. There are people like President Thomas S. Monson, who when he had free time, when he could choose for himself what to do in a spare moment, sought to serve others. That is what brought him joy, and that is what brings God joy. I believe that one measure of our willingness to abide by celestial law is how much joy we derive from service. 
As I've mentioned before to some of you, when I get as much joy out of serving as I do from watching BYU win an athletic contest, I will know that I'm beginning to develop a true desire to abide by a celestial law. If we can begin to see our choices as formative acts that manifest and increase our desire and ability to abide by the celestial laws that give God a fullness of joy, we will greatly advance our spiritual and secular education. Now, another example of President Nelson's emphasis on choices and decisions is found in his memorable, memorable discussion about the importance of knowing the truth of who we are. President Nelson began that instruction with a declaration that, quote, if the Lord were speaking to you directly tonight, the first thing he would make sure you understand is your true identity, close quote. It's hard for me to imagine a stronger way to underscore the importance of knowing who we really are, that it would be the first thing Christ would want us to understand if he were personally delivering a message to us. The significance of that truth was further underscored by President Nelson's powerful instruction on the importance of making sure our true identity as children of God, children of the covenant, and disciples of Jesus Christ remains our primary identity. Recognizing that while there are other identities that are important to us, President Nelson made clear that Quote, no identifier should displace, replace, or take priority over these three enduring designations, close quote. He then described the disastrous and devastating consequences of misplacing those priorities. If any label replaces your most important identifiers, he said, the results can be spiritually suffocating. Doing so, he added later, could stymie your, your progress and pi or pigeonhole you in a stereotype that could potentially thwart your eternal progression. Spiritual suffocation, stymied progress, thwarted eternal progression, none of those is a good thing. The desire to avoid any one of them should give us sufficient motivation to keep our primary identity as our primary identity. That lesson for me by itself is so significant that it would have been worth all the planning and preparation for that devotional in May by itself. Once again, however, President Nelson tied this important lesson back into the title of his talk with this profound observation. The way you think about who you really are affects almost every decision you will ever make, he said. Think about that for a moment. What would happen if when making decisions such as what to do when someone is rude to you, either in person or online, or what to do on a Friday evening when you feel left out, or even what music you listen to or movies you watch, if when making such decisions you took into account your true identity as a child of God, a child of the covenant, and a disciple of Jesus Christ? It could make a profound difference in your daily lives and your eternal destiny. It might cause you to act differently in a traffic jam, when a roommate borrows your food without permission, or even when you're feeling alone and abandoned. Moreover, if you take into account who you really are when making longer lasting decisions, it will profoundly affect your eternal progress and destiny. The theme of choices and decisions is also found in one aspect of President Nelson's talk that caught my attention when hearing the talk live. His inclusion of children of the covenant in the list of our true primary identities. I was not surprised that President Nelson included children of God and disciples of Jesus Christ as part of our primary, primary enduring identities. I had sung, I am a child of God and I'm trying to be like Jesus in primary, but I couldn't remember a song about being a child of the covenant. Moreover, I will confess that I did not immediately recall having heard that term in any context before. A quick scripture search revealed at least two instances where the term is used in 3 Nephi 20 and 26 and Acts 3.25. A little more searching revealed, somewhat to my embarrassment, that President Nelson had actually focused on the concept in at least two general conference talks, one of which was entitled Children of the Covenant. I made a note to myself again to start paying atten more attention to the titles of President Nelson's talks. In those two talks given in April 1995 and October 2011, when President Nelson was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, President Nelson made clear that children of the covenant are those who enter into and keep sacred covenants with God, including the covenant first made with their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
I also learned, and this is now quoting from President Nelson's talk, that a giant step towards spiritual immunity is taken when we understand the expression, children of the covenant. That committed children of the covenant remain steadfast even in the midst of adversity. That children of the covenant become a strain of sin-resistant souls. And that when we realize that we are children of the covenant, we know who we are and what God expects of us. Clearly, there is power in fully understanding the significance of our true identity as children of the covenant. Covenants bind us to the Lord and allow us to draw on his strength as we draw closer to and become more like him. But again, choice comes into play. As President Nelson explained in his devotional talk, if you choose to make covenants with God and are faithful to those covenants, you have the promise of glory added upon your head forever and ever. As you make decisions in the coming year, ask yourself, is this choice helping me make and keep sacred covenants? Is it consistent with my identity as a child of the covenant, as an heir to the promises made to Abraham? To repeat President Nelson, when we realize that we are children of the covenant, we know what God expects of us. What a great aid to us in making decisions. The overarching theme of the importance of our choices is also found in other portions of President Nelson's devotional. When summarizing the truth about what Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ have offered each of us, President Nelson noted, God will do everything he can short of violating your agency to help you not miss out on the greatest blessings in eternity. God, who has all power, will do all in his power to exalt us. But ultimately, we have to choose for ourselves. He will not, he cannot make that choice for us. As the hymn explains so well, know this, that every soul is free to choose his life and what he'll be. For this eternal truth is given that God will force no man to heaven. C.S. Lewis put it more pointedly. There are, he said, only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. In the long run, the choice is up to us. To quote President Nelson again, during this life, we get to choose which laws we are willing to obey, and therefore, in which kingdom of glory we will live forever. Thus, as President Nelson made clear, and as Peggy has just emphasized, we have to own our own conversion. The choice is up to us. Let me conclude with an observation, an admonition, an invitation, and a promise. The observation reflects one more insight about the central ro role of agency in the plan of salvation that I gleaned from President Nelson's talk. I noted that the second and third of our three primary identities, children of the covenant and disciples of Jesus Christ, are identities that we choose for ourselves. We become children of the covenant through our actions by becoming members of the church, and we become disciples of Christ by keeping his commandments. By contrast, the first of the three primary identities, child of God, is not dependent on our choice. It is a fact. We are his children, even if we refuse to recognize that fact. And because we are his children, he will love us, even if we choose not, not to love him. As the Apostle Paul indicated, God's love is always available to us. I am persuaded, Paul wrote, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because we are his children, God will love us. But we still have a choice, whether or not to feel and reciprocate that love. Literature is full of stories of unrequited love, love that is deep and sincere but not reciprocated. My heartfelt admonition to you is don't be part of what would surely be the most tragic of all stories of unrequited love by refusing to feel the transformative, soul-changing love that God and Christ offer you if you will just choose 
to accept it. Nothing, nothing, nothing but your own will can separate you from the love of God. No sin, no harm inflicted by others, no failure, no mistake can alter God's love for you. Please let him love you. The invitation is simple. I invite you to read or reread President Nelson's devotional talk. It is inspired revelation given by a prophet for your benefit in your current situation. Consider how the counsel he gives can help you in making the many decisions you will face in the coming year. I promise that as you do so, you will receive personal revelation so that you can proceed with confidence in making decisions. I feel secure in making that promise because it really is echoing a promise given by President Nelson at the end of his devotional. After he blessed those listening with enhanced ability to follow the counsel he had just given, President Nelson stated, quote, as you do so, I promise that you will experience spiritual growth, freedom from fear, and a confidence you, that you can scarcely imagine now. You will have strength to have a positive influence far beyond your natural capacity. And I promise that your future will be more exhilarating than anything you can presently believe." Close quote. That is a prophetic promise on which you can re rely. I bear my witness that God lives and loves each one of you. He knows who you really are, and he wants you to succeed at BYU and in life. You just need to choose to let him prevail in your life. As you do so, God's love will transform you. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this opportunity that we've had to be able to hear from President Sister Worthen. We're thankful for their leadership of this university, and please bless them in all aspects of their lives. Please help us as we continue to go throughout this semester that we'll be able to be inspired on the choices that we should make in our lives. We're grateful for these messages, and please help us to remember the things that we've learned tonight and to have thy spirit to guide us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by BYU President Gavin J. Worthen and Sister Peggy Worthen. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss next week's live devotional address at this same time with President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And tune in to BYU Radio tomorrow and every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific for Finding Center, an hour of spiritual focus on what matters most. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.